The problem with talking a big game in combat sports is that you have to back it up. And if you can't, you're destined to end up on a video just like this. Here's what happens when trash talkers get what they deserve. The phrase, fake it till you make it, does not apply to the imitation of famous mixed martial arts stars. And for Maurice Adorf, it didn't matter how hard he tried to look, act, and trash talk like Conor McGregor, he simply wasn't on the Irishman's level. Thankfully, MMA has a way of exposing frauds like this guy, and as soon as the fight began, it became clear that this guy was not on McGregor's level. In fact, it took just over a minute for his opponent to brutally drop him to the canvas before then stiffening him with a nasty head kick finish. You just can't pretend to be a world-class fighter. Eventually, you're going to be exposed and end up on someone's highlight reel. Why is it always the tattooed fighters who act tough but end up disappointing when the time comes to throw hands? This dude, Julian Wallace, definitely appeared to be the more fearsome looking fighter between himself and Ben Wynn. By contrast, this was a very tough looking guy against a dude who almost looked like he walked off the street. But for all of Wallace's attempts to get in Ben's head, it mattered little. No, on fight night, Wynn proved that he was on a different level, totally bulldozing his way through Wallace, proving once and for all that looking the part just isn't enough. As it turned out, Wynn would eventually make his way to the UFC, and Wallace, well, Wallace ended up in every trash talking getting destroyed video on YouTube. <laughs> If you're trying to inhabit the role of a rocky villain, just make sure you're able to keep up with your opponent. For Curtis Stevens, he talked a big talk before taking on the great David Lemieux, promising he would be serving up some real pain for his opponent on fight night. Unfortunately for him, he didn't come out of this bout looking good. Not at all. His confidence pre-fight was admirable, sure, but when Lemieux almost knocked him straight out of the ring for the easy KO, all that pre-fight trash talk seemed pretty hollow in hindsight. Not the best night of Curtis Stevens' career. What can he expect from the Cerebral Assassin? Oh, pain. Pain, you know when them two fakes? You ever had a bad two fake that you uh, didn't go get taken out just yet? Or you had a surgery and they give you no uh, medicine to uh, help you cope with it? One of them type of pains. Pain that's, uh, you need something to come and your body to take it away. A straight pain, though. There weren't many mid-tier fighters who could have been convinced to step in there and serve as Mike Tyson's opponent after over four years on the sidelines. But Peter McNeely deserves credit for putting his name on the contract, even if it all but guaranteed a brutal knockout loss. And to his credit, McNeely did well to sell the fight, doing his best pro wrestler impression to drive up interest among the fans. But man, this version of Iron Mike had a point to prove. And after years in prison, his aggression could be felt all through fight week. It took him just 90 seconds to force McNeely's corner to step in. A total demolition job by the legendary Iron Mike Tyson. I'm Hurricane Peter McNeely from Medfield, Mass. On Saturday night, watch me kick Tyson's ass. We have you for just a moment before you go out into the ring, your thoughts before you get in with Mike Tyson. This is for my grandfathers, my grandmothers, my father, my mother, Curly, my three brothers, 
last but not least, Snubby. With Peter Hurt, Vinny Vecchioni, his manager, prevented him from taking any more damage, causing the referee lane to end the fight and award Tyson the victory. Stand up. In this fight, he's got about 30 seconds left. They want Tyson to go to the new Marco Antonio Barrera is an iconic fighter who shut up more than a few trash talkers in his day. And when the time came to defend his title against the more experienced former Olympian Kennedy McKinney, the older fighter made sure to do everything in his power to belittle Barrera and his experience pre-fight. He pretty much trash talked him through the entire buildup, showing no respect for this future legend's abilities. Unfortunately, all this did was wake up something truly fierce within Barrera, and on fight night, he let out all that fury, dropping McKinney five times to eventually win a dominant 12-round decision. A house and a car, bills I gotta pay, and I dare for you to come here and think you can beat me, huh? Think you can beat me, boy. You cannot beat me. You cannot whoop me here in my town. This is... Taunting a power puncher is always a tricky proposition. On one hand, you could throw them off their game enough to make a mistake, but more often than not, you'll end up like Jose Luis Zertucci, the guy who decided to constantly taunt Kelly Pavlik whenever he landed a big shot. Zertucci would repeatedly throw his hands up in the air to try and make light of the situation whenever Pavlik landed. Even after Kelly scored a big knockdown on him in the middle rounds, he just kept taunting. Eventually, though, he was put to bed in round nine with a brutal combo, ending his night right then and there and shutting him up once and for all. Right now, uh, all he needs to be doing is setting up some serious power shots uh, and, and going through with it. Oh, great right hand! And there it is! You know, the Chuchi, we relaxed a bit, boom! Didn't see that right hand coming over the top. Look, if you're going to act like a total douche pre-fight, just make sure you survive longer than 10 seconds. Because when this guy made his walk into the cage, there wasn't a single person in the audience who didn't want to see him get a slice of humble pie. Okay, maybe his family. But this dude was about to get hit by a major embarrassment. Despite doing everything in his power to look extremely confident pre-fight, he ran into his opponent's shot immediately and was out cold on the canvas by the time the fight clock hit 10 seconds. An embarrassingly bad performance that was only made worse by how he conducted himself pre-fight. Collision. He walked out by an entourage and his trainers. 10 years of age, both fighters weighed in approximately the same weight. Ow! Oh! He's hurt! He's hurt! He's hurt! He's hurt! He's out! Unbelievable! Then the Amitesh Chobe is your new Super Fight League welterweight championship of the world. I said this. If you're going to employ a weird, drunken master style of fighting against a guy like Melvin Manhoof, well, unless you find a way to his chin, all you're doing is buying time. Because for this guy, his odd style of flashy taunts only served to confuse the Dutch kickboxer until he'd made his reads. A guy as experienced as Manhoof does not take long to gauge his opponent's timing. And in this case, despite it looking like this cocky fighter was doing well early on, eventually that momentum totally slipped, and Melvin left this dude on the floor out cold. A classic example of experience and veteran savvy reigning supreme. <laughs> Another man off, but well, he may soon learn that lesson. But he did it all, he did it again. Big right hand. Well, Manoff was having none of that. 
He just sunk a heavy, heavy right hand onto the chin. Taking shots at an aging legend is kind of aiming low, don't you think? Well, for Keith Thurman, a guy who is never afraid to speak his mind, he decided to go on the offensive with the 40-year-old Manny Pacquiao, taking his trash-talking with him to fight week while making fun of Manny for being an older veteran. The problem? Well, even with all those years on his tank, Manny was still the far superior fighter, and over 12 rounds, he proved it, beating Thurman in a truly great display, running back the clock and showing the world he still has some gas in the tank. Pacquiao is the type of fighter you can never rule out, and this fight proves why. Times change. I believe boxing has come to a new era. Floyd is gone. Pacquiao is here. Come July 20th, he will disappear. Gentlemen, we went over the rules in the dressing room. The smile from Danny Pacquiao. Oh, oh down oh, goes oh. Thurman! And let me tell you, that was just a quick punch. And Manny Pacquiao moved in with his legs. And Badr Hari is a legend of the fight game. But make no mistake, he could be totally unlikable at times too. And when facing off against Peter Graham, he showed him some major disrespect from the get-go, belittling his fighting skills, and then even kicking off a brawl backstage with him. This only served to make Hari look like the villain coming into this bout. Thankfully, Peter Graham had something special up his sleeve for this one, unleashing a devastating rolling thunder kick in the third round that put Hari out cold. Seriously, not only was this one of the greatest knockouts in kickboxing history, but it's also an all-timer in combat sports, period. I see your tape, I see you fighting. You look like an amateur. Something else. How old are you? Oh. I'm 30, man. Okay. You dropped dead. What the Ricardo Mayorga is one mean guy. This hard-drinking, hard-smoking boxer made absolutely no effort to soften his personality for the cameras, always bringing a level of trash talk and overall aggression to the table that outdid every single one of his opponents. But when he took on Felix Trinidad, something very different happened. Sure, all the pre-fight trash talk was there, and even in the ring, he taunted Trinidad repeatedly, even putting his hands down to let him land punches. But this tactic did not work the way he intended. No, Felix just piled on the pressure, eventually TKOing Mayorga after multiple knockdowns. You gotta respect Mayorga's stubbornness, but it just wasn't working for him here. When Tito caiga, when Tito falls, and there's two or three seconds of silence after he falls, the only guy that's going to go is Papa for me. The only guy that's going to go to the ring. A, pro, a proteger a su niño que, que sabe que. Knockout in nine. Le pasó, le pasó de la hora. Young. This next one, Park vs. Musashi, was a Japanese K-1 showdown that was hindered early on by repeated low blows from Park that left Musashi in some serious agony. It happened too many times to be a coincidence, folks, and you could just tell that Musashi was in some real pain, and his frustration and anger was only growing. So when Park finally stopped kicking him low, and the fight became fair, Musashi let all his aggression out with a brutal KO sequence, 
putting Parks' lights out once and for all. He wasn't done just yet. No, he was so angry, he proceeded to taunt him some more, and even supposedly stamped on his opponent's unconscious body. An ugly fight with an even uglier ending. Taught a puncher like David Benavidez, you might just end up like Porky Medina. Because at first, everything seemed to be going to plan for him. Benavidez was getting the better of the exchanges, but Medina was landing his own shots. And his taunting of Benavidez was certainly allowing him to build confidence. But Benavidez was the better fighter here. And when he finally saw the opening, he rattled off an insanely pretty combo to get his man out of there. The hand speed on display here was truly next level. <laughs> Mansoor Barnawi has been one of the best fighters outside the UFC for years, but when he came up against Quan A. Sol, he found himself fighting an opponent who seemed determined to try to get in his head. The pre-fight aggression on display here was all coming from Quan, and if you didn't know any better, you'd be forgiven for assuming that he had the mental edge coming. But Barnawi was, of course, the far superior fighter. And to say he dominated this bout would be putting it lightly. It took him just one round to comprehensively beat down his opponent and secure the submission. A thoroughly non-competitive fight. Opponent oh. and now into full mount. Oh. Hustle's, Hustle's in trouble. He's looking to give up. He's giving up his back. He's going in deeper. Mansour is just taking his time. Look at that. Almost oh, so oh. and there it is. David Hay really did his best to try and make things personal between himself and Vladimir Klitschko in the build-up to their world title fight, telling the media that he legitimately hated the champ and his brother Vitali while doing everything in his power to taunt and aggravate him. But here's the problem. Vladimir couldn't have cared less. In fact, he was so unbothered by hate that the British fighter basically sold the fight on his own. And then when the time came to actually box, Klitschko turned in a dominant display, beating the brakes off Hay to win a comfortable decision on the scorecards. I just want to shake hands to begin this. Can I get you to shake hands? You know, you can, you know, shake you want to give your hand? I'll, I'll, I'll shake you down on July 2nd. It's not going to happen. He's too slow. He's way too slow to come to the table with me. He's coming to a gunfight unarmed. And he's going to get destroyed. Let's go. Let's go. Well, the touch gloves didn't quite. Himself into the fight. He is the one improving, but this is the end. But then Klitschko again landing the better shot. Stop! Come over here in the thousands. Having the big shots in this fight. Yeah, but I mean, this guy, we have to remember, two score weight. Hamburg, and both of them try to throw bombs right to the final bell. Both of them raise their arms. This one was an absolute classic. Joe Harding looked like a million bucks during the early stages of his clash with Johan Segas. The problem? Well, this wasn't a high-level MMA fight. No, this was a battle from the amateur scene, and Harding was not the world talent he was pretending to be. The dude was dancing and taunting Sagas at every possible opportunity, up until Sagas read his timing and landed the perfect head kick. And thus, a viral moment was born, and it could be said that this was the single most embarrassing loss in MMA history. What I said is... You don't, Unbelievable. you don't do that kind of stuff, it ends up getting pain. Look, just because you're getting ahead in a fight, it doesn't mean you should resort to taunting. Because if things take a turn for the worse, then you're bound to end up on a video like this. But let's be real, landing a few good shots on a fighter as great as Adonis Stevenson is no easy feat. And Thomas Williams deserves credit for that. The problem was that he decided to mock the veteran with a dance move at the end of a solid round. And the even bigger problem? It arose when Stevenson KO'd him stiff shortly after. 
That's the type of viral embarrassment you just don't live down. Why do these fighters resort to taunting Mike Tyson? The dude came up as a street fighter. You're not going to improve your situation by making an enemy of him. No, Tyson was as motivated a puncher as they come. And despite Trevor Burbick being the more experienced fighter in there with Iron Mike, he came across as amateurish when he welcomed Tyson to his first world title fight at the age of just 20. Burbick, being the veteran, could have been expected to bring some maturity, but no. He tried to taunt Tyson into making a mistake. Mike didn't blink an eye and instead ended up TKOing Burbick in the second round with little issue to win a dominant championship victory. Another David Hay mishap comes in next, courtesy of his embarrassing antics in there with Tony Bellew. The fight was competitive enough at first, so much so that Hay felt confident to drop his hands and taunt Bellew with no guard up. Bellew didn't exactly take the bait, and so Hay resorted to trying to sucker punch Tony after a fake glove touch, missing wildly with his leaping shot. The crowd were now very clearly on Bellew's side, and so when he managed to brutally TKO Hay by sending him out of the ring, the boxing world applauded him for taking out the trash. Thomas Tate looked awfully confident for a guy who was about to step in there with a prime Roy Jones Jr. In fact, you'd be forgiven for thinking that he was the betting favorite and not Jones. Tate was talking some serious trash pre-fight, constantly jawing at the champion at every opportunity. But Jones remained composed and let his fighting do the talking. And it didn't take long for Roy to land with his signature leaping left hook nailing Tate right on the jaw with his powerful weapon. And though he did actually beat the 10 count, the dude was on wobbly legs and his coach decided to step in and save him from a much worse fate. New UFC signing Michael Venom Page was still riding his own hyper train when he came face to face with the promotional great Douglas Lima. This was by far and away the greatest test of MVP's career, and early on, he appeared to be passing it. Page looked pretty good in there with the more experienced Lima, but his flashy style of fighting and clear overconfidence would come back to bite him in the most shocking fashion when Lima managed to sweep MVP's leg out from underneath him, leaving his chin exposed for the knockout blow. It doesn't matter how elusive your footwork is or how good you are at moving your head. When your base is taken away, you're a sitting duck. And that's what we saw here. This next one is all kinds of brutal. David Tua is a man who is known for his remarkable punching power. And though he was relatively mild-mannered, Shane Cameron made the mistake of provoking him pre-fight. In fact, the entire build-up to his heavyweight affair was just constant trash-talking, with each man delivering shot after shot at each other. But on fight night, despite Cameron looking pretty confident there beforehand, Tua absolutely bulldozed him from start to finish, destroying him with numerous knockdowns, making the difference in quality between them as clear as day. Some fighters go entire careers without taking as much damage as Cameron did in these opening two rounds. 
a totally uncompetitive contest. Yeah, these two don't see eye to eye. Well, you a professional, man. How long have you been out of the ring for? I don't make any difference. Like I said, I wasn't beaten up like you. <laughs> well, I've seen the Lennox Lewis fights, man. You took a hiding. It's 74 days till the fight, but the pair couldn't help firing a few early shots. Two are still comparing the mountain warrior to a mountain goat, offering it as an excuse for why he was late to the press conference. I got a text about 2.30 this morning. If you want to fight, come to the mountains of Gisborne. And then there's signs, the mountain goat. I was up on that hill at about one, 1 o'clock this morning. I seen you struggling, trying to get up to the goat, so you were nowhere to be seen, mate. You know, you were huffing and puffing. Looked like you were going to have a heart attack, so... Uh... Oh, and he got him again. James ready to go. And he's down in round one. James in a heap of trouble. Down he goes again. Oh, that's a disqualification. I don't know about that. It won't be, but I'm just saying. He's hitting the ball. He's on the floor. And five. And six. And seven. He's got the end of victory. And Shane is hurt. That shows you David Tua is back. My God, that was devastating. If you're going to claim that you're sharper, smarter, and a better boxer than your opponent, just make sure that your opponent isn't the great Josh Taylor. Because for O'Hara Davies, his pre-fight trash talk did not prepare his fans well for what was about to follow. In the war of words, maybe you could make an argument for him. But man, when the hands started flying, it was all Josh Taylor in there. He roasted Davies from start to finish, destroying him with far cleaner punching technique until the ref eventually waved the contest off. This was a real lesson in the levels that exist in the fight game, folks. I hit harder than him. I'm a lot sharper than him. And I'm a lot smarter than him. I think that's quite funny. You've never seen me get hurt. You've never seen me take a count. You've never seen me really get hit. How he thinks that he's going to be knocking me out, I don't understand. Another guy who made the mistake of crossing David Benavidez comes in next, with Anthony Durrell, who made a point of mocking Benavidez's boxing abilities at every turn, resorting to lame trash talk in an attempt to rattle the veteran. Even in the ring, Benavidez was forced to watch his opponent taunting him. But as the fight went deeper, things got very, very bad for Durrell. In fact, Benavidez was putting on such a thorough clinic of his elite level skills that Jarrell's corner was forced to step in and throw in the towel. An embarrassing display from a man who showed so much confidence pre-fight. Easy. I'll knock him out. I can get in there and knock him out the first round. Is he the best guy I fought? No. Uh, I'm, I'm a monster in there. I'm a monster. Coming out the closet for him. Do you think you can knock out David Benavidez? Oh, for sure. He got hurt with a jab and dropped with a jab. I hit harder than Gabriel. I promise I do. Shit coming. He's he's talked to Doghouse. <laughs> your instructions in the back. Protect yourselves at all times. This is my command. Back to corner, John. Oh, that was a nice counter hook by Benavidez. Great liver shot on the right hand. This is going to end any second. Taking a toll on Anthony Terrell. So, so he's, he's on a defensive mode right now, and Benavides just took advantage of the situation in the sense of throwing the right punches. And uh, combination punches, and you know, all over the place. Definitely the body punches, the hooks. Just gave you variations of different punches. This is the commissioner running in. This next one is a story of two different types of fighter. The type who talks a big game but can't back it up, and the type who doesn't need to let words into the equation. And while this boxer seemed to be the far more confident of the two, when the time came to actually let his fighting come to the fore, he turned in a truly dismal showing. In fact, his more stoic opponent made absolute mincemeat of him on fight night 
brutalizing him with power punches to eventually leave him folded up on the canvas like a deck chair. A classic example of why talk is cheap compared to actual boxing prowess. Another appearance from Ricardo Mayorga comes in next, and yet another example of him completely crossing personal boundaries. Mayorga actually slapped Shane Mosley's girlfriend on her backside, something that took the already high levels of hype for this fight to another level. But when the fighting began, Mayorga just didn't have anything for the far superior fighter Mosley. And when Sugar Shane landed a clean body blow that put Mayorga down, that was all that was needed to award him the TKO win. You just don't rebound from body shots like that. Te voy a pesar 158 para matarte. He's going to weigh 158 pounds to kill him. He you know, smacked my ass. What do you mean? He, he smacked my ass. No, I understand. And you should have fucking killed him when he did it. I tried. Somebody who's holding me? Everybody's grabbing everybody, holding everybody back. I don't need to press charges. There's nothing that a cop's going to do more than what he's going to do. And you're going to fucking right. kill his ass, beat his fucking ass. <laughs> I want to just fucking see kicking his butt, like seriously, on the ground, I don't care, there's no ref stopping it, fucking kill his ass. 40-somethings in here will both appear weary and maybe oh. full. And down goes Mayorga. He's claiming a low blow. He's claiming a low blow. Referee is counting. says no. He's not going to get up. Look, Bernard Hopkins is a legend of the fight game the type of veteran who managed to extend his career far longer than expected thanks to his ridiculously good defensive skills. But when he came up against Joe Smith Jr., he made some crucial errors in judgment. Sure, his own best days were probably behind him, but during the pre-fight buildup, he said two things that will forever be remembered among the most ironic lines of trash talk of all time. First, he compared his own clear greatness to Smith's very ordinary skills while he was sitting right there, a flat-out disrespectful level of disregard for the danger an opponent can bring. And then, Hopkins told Smith to his face that he would never let a white boy beat him. Unfortunately, both of those lines would come back to haunt him in a huge way when Smith literally knocked him out of the ring and into retirement. As bad a pre-fight display as you'll ever see, with some major consequences in the ring itself. There's always going to be someone that you have to prove that you're special, no matter how many titles you win, no matter how much money you got, no matter what you do, you're always going to have that. But if you use that for motivation, if you use that to stay in the game respectfully, then you become special and an icon surpasses legend. Common man. Special man. You know I, was I would never let a white boy be me. I would never let a white boy be me. I would never let a white boy be me. I would never let a white boy be me. I never let a white boy be me. You call me any statement you want. Anybody can print that. I would never lose to a white person. What does this mean to you out of all your fights, this being the final one here in Los Angeles? for the final one. I'll be able to give a guy Joe Smith his final ass whooping. If you're gonna try and cheat, just make sure your opponent isn't packing the type of firepower and technical mastery that Cedric Dumbay brings to the table. This former kickboxer turned MMA super prospect was fighting Alim Nabiev in a fight that wasn't overly noteworthy until Nabiev landed several clear punches 
to the back of Cedric's head. Illegal shots that did not go unnoticed by the referee officiating. Dumbe had every reason to feel hard done by here, but he didn't let his anger get the better of him. No, instead, he channeled it into a barrage of punishment that first led to a knockdown and then later a TKO after a flurry of powerful shots. It was a clear attempt to cheat from Nabiev, but thankfully Dumbe was more than capable of serving up some painful justice under the bright lights of the glory ring.